Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I am Adam, your co-host. Our first topic for tonight is I wanted to follow up on Okta's support system breach that they had a few weeks ago. And the reason why is because Okta concluded their investigation. And out of that, they said that the reason why their system was compromised was due to an employee signing into their personal Google profile on a Chrome browser on their Okta managed laptop and the username and password of the service account was saved into the employee's personal Google account. And the most likely avenue for exposure of this credential is the compromise of the employee's personal Google account or personal device. Now remember this compromise was fairly significant in severity, in my opinion, because the threat actor had access to internal customer support cases as well as archived HAR files or HTTP archive files that included session tokens to administrative sessions with customer tenants. And we talked through that the last time where Okta recommended that their customers sanitize these HAR files and remove those session tokens, but that often wasn't done. And... You know, the vector of compromise here where an employee is logged into a Chrome account where it was authenticated, that getting saved into a personal Google account is something that really in an enterprise environment shouldn't happen because you shouldn't allow, first and foremost, personal accounts to be signed in to a Chrome browser. Now, I don't know what type of devices they use. My assumption with Okta being a more startup-y type organization, maybe they're using Chromebooks, but highly doubt it. They're probably using Macs, in, in my opinion. And so having Chrome browsers and not using Safari, I mean, that does make a little bit of sense because Chrome is a little bit more ubiquitous. It's a Chromium browser versus Safari, which, you know, we don't have to get into the semantics of it, but more people use Chrome than, than not in an enterprise, when, especially when it comes to MacBooks. But there are a ton of lessons that I think should be taken away because while Adam and I do both work for Microsoft and we obviously are very familiar with the Microsoft ecosystem, we do these academic breakdowns of these compromises mainly because I think there's a lot of takeaways that you should do in your environment, some checklist to say, Hey, do, am I doing this? Am I doing this? If not, then I need to be. And so when I look at it from a cybersecurity perspective, I see a bunch of things that if you're doing this in your environment, you should change. And Okta made some changes as part of their operation. So number one, using a shared service account to access a highly sensitive system with administrative credentials and access to customer information, session tokens, all sorts of stuff, right? So it's a privileged system, sensitive information, and you're using a shared service account with no MFA. You assume that, It's a shared service account. I also assume that it's a cloud service account being Okta, having an identity provider. I'm assuming it's not like an on-prem synced account to Okta, although it might be, but I'm assuming in this case, right? I don't know all the details, but Okta being a startup-y type organization, I assume they have very little on-prem presence. And so let's assume it's a cloud service account, no MFA, I mean, there's one major issue right there, right? It should be a federated identity with administrative access granted to that role rather than a shared account. 
definitely should have MFA if it has administrative access into sensitive data. And then there should be some conditions to authenticating to that. Now, on Okta, there is such a thing as device trust, but very basic, could have just been network controls. Understand that network controls are not zero trust because your network can be compromised and then you have that avenue of trust right there just kind of taken away. But that could have been something because the actor might have just been outside of the corporate network and act, trying to access this cloud account. So that's one thing that they could have done. They could have done trusted devices, which would have been much better. Having a managed device be a condition to accessing this account. And Okta has that capability through device trust. And then, um, like I said, Okta, as part of their remediation, they are using network-based controls or corporate IP addresses for their own administrative session tokens now. And then blocking the use of Google profiles, personal group Google profiles on organization devices. And Okta, again, is now doing that via Chrome Enterprise. And if your organization uses Chrome, as its primary browser, whether it's on Windows or Mac or wherever. Chrome has built-in controls through Chrome Enterprise that you can manage the configurations and block certain settings or allow certain settings. You can block certain extensions or allow certain extensions, personal profiles, stuff like that. Um, you can do it through group policy. You can do it through their native cloud management which is actually very, very slick. There's a registry key that's pushed out for management on Windows if you want to do it that way. But it's instead of having to manage the settings through group policy on-prem, you're just deploying a session token or a token that's synced up with their cloud management. And then all of the management's done through Chrome's cloud management console that can then configure anything that's tied to that session token. You can also manage it natively through Intune. If you're a Microsoft customer, you can manage Chrome browsers on any Intune enrolled device. That means Android. That means um, Mac OS. It means Windows. So either way, if Chrome is part of your enterprise strategy, you can manage it. Or better yet, if you're a Microsoft customer, you could just use Edge with a lot of these controls that are natively built into Edge for enterprise applications. There's some security features like application guard that aren't available on Chrome. You have built in single sign on into intro federated applications. So think about maybe migrating away because edge is basically the same thing as Chrome. It's built off of Chromium renders pages the same way and you have all the native security features built in. So those are some of my takeaways. I talked a lot, Adam, I want to give you some time to give you uh, give your thoughts on the the after actions of this investigation. But as I read through this, there's some hard hitting lessons here that every organization should take away and immediately take a look at their enterprise and see if these apply. We did talk through this and I liked your point and I'm just going to reiterate it because it's really important to the overall concept of our show. We do work for Microsoft. We do the show outside of work. This is not a work function. But even if it were, and to be clear, it's not, I don't revel in anyone suffering a security incident. Andy and I are both of the belief cybersecurity is a team sport. And I say on this show all the time, a rising tide lifts all ships. So... When we talk through this, like Andy mentioned, it is the academic study of a security incident and what takeaways we can give to our listeners, the folks wearing the blue hats out there in the world, defending your organizations and enterprises, what can we all learn and do better moving forward? And just want to really reiterate that just like you can go to a public school and you can still do an academic study of world religions. I took a world religions class at a public school. I went to Iowa State University. And again, there's no conflict there because you can do that 
academically. So I really just wanted to reiterate that point. Moving to the specifics here. There is great <laughs> irony in the fact that Okta is a very solid cloud identity provider. And it seems like they are using some sort of, it had to be some sort of shared account in some way for those credentials to be be able to lead to compromise or at, or or even worse, if it's not shared, then it's not federated, which would be deeply ironic as well. But either way, um, really, Andy, I think you got to the meat of it. You need to get to a point where if if a threat actor has a username and password, they can't do anything with it. Andy and I used to work with a gentleman at Microsoft named Daniel Stefaniak. And one of Daniel's shtick, for lack of a better term, that he would do when he engage with customers is he'd walk up to the whiteboard and write his credentials on the whiteboard. He'd say, here's my username and password. And the purpose of doing that was to say, Microsoft has additional controls to where this is insufficient. Number one, you're going to need multi-factor authentication. Number two, you're going to need a managed and trusted device before you can do anything with these credentials. And so that's the same goal here. Andy listed a couple of them off looking for a managed device, some sort of device trust, or at least device management checking would be really valuable. It sounds like Octa said, hey, we're doing IP-based controls, which is not great, but I guess it's better than absolutely nothing. Um, but there should be some sort of conditions above and beyond just username and password. Multi-factor authentication at a bare minimum. And then I like the conversation around Chrome. And we talked through this when, in our chat with some of our buddies, Andy, but also there was a question on a internal chat around my role at Microsoft, the security specialist role. Hey, what would be our guidance if a customer came to us on how to remediate this? And, and the number one thing, and Andy, you touched on this, is you should not allow someone to sign in with a consumer credential, a non-enterprise credential to Chrome and then go sync their tabs and their favorites and all of the things that come with signing into that Google account. And there are very good, Google makes very good management controls. So you should at a bare minimum turn that on. However, another thing we talk about on this show all the time is we don't like the concept of security being Dr. No and just taking stuff away. If you're going to take stuff away, then you need to at the same time provide an enterprise grade alternative. And Andy touched on that. So if you're a Microsoft customer, then you have an enterprise grade credential. It's your worker school account, your Entra ID account. Now, Microsoft Edge for Business is based around that enterprise credential. So you can use the Edge browser, you can sign in with the enterprise credential, and you get all of the same sync, favorite sync, tab sync, all the other flavors of sync that are there. And now you've delivered to your users that same level of service and capability, but built around an enterprise credential that you control. And you can control when and where it can be used. And if someone were to leave the organization, you can withdraw that credential. And it's, it's built on Chromium just the same. So to me, that's a clear win. And I get not everyone's built on Microsoft. And so I'm sure without being super knowledgeable about this, if you're a Google Workspace shop, you can build it around only allow Google account sign-in to like an enterprise Google credential. I'm sure that's a thing and I'm sure that's possible. I'm just not familiar with it. But either way, you, you shouldn't allow your enterprise credentials to be synced to a consumer account and then leave the company. But I think the bigger issue is even if that happens, that shouldn't matter as well. So like with so many things in InfoSec, it goes back to defense and depth. You want to do both because that gives you those added layers of protection that if one layer fails, another layer compensates. 
So uh, great discussion on this, Andy. I, I like just taking something simple like this and walking through a couple of ways to help mitigate or reduce the risk for our listeners moving forward. One thing I also want to mention about this, let's talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. managed devices because in Okta's case, and I understand that Okta is a competitor to Microsoft and we sell a, a competitive mm -hmm. solution in Entra. But the capabilities of Okta are very good. I'm not knocking them. They have very good capabilities. They have Score good security very features. They can every do the IQ. They're very well reviewed. Yep. Correct. And I mentioned that they have device trust built in. However, they are first and foremost an identity provider. And this conversation is important for defenders and security architects when you're looking at the overall design of your company's security. Okta does not have a device management platform. They rely on third parties. And so we've talked about this architecture where you can provide the authentication to a specific application, but then you rely on a third party to provide device compliance. And the way that it checks out is we're going to do something within Okta to check that third party. And as long as it's enrolled and managed by that third party, then you're good to access the application. We're depending on the third party to continually assess that compliance. And at some point, maybe the compliance will go out of check and then it'll send a flag back to Okta and say, oh, it, the device is out of compliance and now you can't access. So let's talk through this real quick because these Device trust settings have been the same for many years since I was an Okta administrator. On Windows, it only works with domain joined machines. It's a certificate that has to be uploaded from your domain controller, your root certificate, and that root certificate, as long as it appears on the device, then it checks out and it's being managed by, say, group policy or SCCM or something like that. For Mac OS systems, the only device management platform that Okta works with and can integrate with their device trust is Jamf. So we talked about it in the beginning where I assumed that they were probably using some sort of Mac identity provider, kind of startup -y. That would mean that they have to purchase Jamf licenses in order to provide device management. Otherwise, it's like what most companies are like, which is the wild, wild west when it comes to Mac device management. It's just, we give you a Mac, you have single sign-on into your cloud apps, but everything else is just kind of on your own. You have local admin access, and we're not going to do any management. For, for iOS and Android devices, there's a few, like, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but Intune's one of them. Mo VMware, MobileIron, AirWatch, stuff like that. So those are the ones that, you know, as long as you have it managed there, they can hook back into Okta and provide device trust and there's different ways to do it um like one example for intune i actually did configure this you have to deploy the company portal and then the okta verify application and then you have to go into intune which has a way to configure a deployed app it's called app configuration and as part of that app configuration, once I deploy the app, I actually have to modify the app configuration and send a string that ties it back to the Okta portal. So it not only sees that I've deployed the Okta Verify app, which is their MFA, but I also see the string on the back end that ties it back to say, yes, this is a managed device because that string can only get pushed out via a management platform like Intune. So... That's how it sees that it's managed, and then it, it trusts, quote-unquote, the device. And so if you have an application that you've configured device trust for, then it sees that. Importantly enough, this is a conversation that you should be having when it comes to security architecture because if you're choosing a platform like Okta or Ping or other IDPs that don't have a native device management platform built in, you're going to have to rely on something else. So otherwise... It's going to be like the Wild West, like I said. If you're using, say, Microsoft, you're an Entro customer, you have the option of using Intune. If you're ME3, which is what most organizations are, that means that you own Intune, you own 
Entra ID P1, all the stuff that we're talking about right now is configurable and usable. So I wanted to just deep dive into that real quick because it makes a difference in the long run what IDP you choose as well as device management and how they're going to integrate together so that you can prevent this type of stuff from happening. It is a really strong control and really tightly aligned to zero trust principles when you can consume that device compliance state in near real time every time someone attempts to sign into something. Oh, you'd like to access Exchange Online? Well, is your device compliant? And this is something we use at Microsoft all of the time to enforce operating system updates. So Microsoft is very Johnny on the spot when a new Mac OS or iOS update ships. You will have a very short window of time, usually a week or less, to update it. And if you do not do that, then your device will become non-compliant. And when it becomes non-compliant, now you cannot access things like SharePoint Online and Exchange Online. And so if you had the Outlook app configured, all of a sudden it will stop getting mail. Now you've had ample notification. You received an email. The company portal will tell you why you can't. And then you can bring it into compliance quickly. But it's one of those things that illustrates the power of integrating those two platforms. And one of the things we talk about frequently is that Entra ID and Intune grew up together. They co-developed off of each other at the same time, and they've always had that really, really tight integration. So that is a, a relatively unique differentiator for the Microsoft platform that you have that tie of device compliance state with identity and that near real-time checking. And you can even tie that in further to the rest of the security platform. So you can bring in Defender for Endpoint. And one of your compliance checks can be Defender for Endpoint must certify the devices at a low or no threat level. If Defender for Endpoint determines the device is at a higher threat level than that, the device becomes non-compliant and automatically gets shut off from all those identity-based controls again. So without any human intervention, you've been able to isolate the device and prevent it from accessing enterprise data when there's suspicion of compromise. And you can do that at machine speed and scale, which is really, really helpful for security defenders. So just Andy did a great job of summarizing that. It's, it's something that oftentimes is believed to be at parity amongst all the different vendors, and it is something that is not. Now, to be fair, again, because that's not what we're here to do, is to say Microsoft's better at everything, but we are highlighting differences here for def security defenders to understand. And to be fair, Okta does some things really well on their platform that are different and potentially better than Entra ID, as does Ping. And that's for you to do your evaluation and determine. But I think as a lot of folks are thinking about securing their environment, adopting zero trust principles, these are important differences to know because of the, the capability to integrate those two tools that were designed to work together. All right, <laughs> enough about Okta. Let's talk about our final topic that we were going to talk about tonight, which is pass keys. And I wanted to touch on this because it's a fairly new feature. We had talked about pass keys a few months back when it was in the news, but now with iOS updating and Google also updating, pass keys are no longer just a theoretical, hey, it's coming. They're actually here. So what is a pass key? Let's do a little bit of review. It's basically an alphanumeric string that is complete, completely unique to you, and it proves who you are for apps and websites so that you can log in without providing a password traditionally. And it uses public key cryptography. So the app or website will have the public key that you've synced for your pass key, and then you provide the private key, which is unlocked via some sort of usually a biometric or a pin 
you know, because it's your device that is usually storing the pass key. So the, the way that it was designed is trying to provide a passwordless world for the normal user where the pass key can reside on the device that they use most often, which is their phone. So that's ideally how pass keys are supposed to work. Pass keys can be saved in a multitude of different ways. So like on iOS and Mac, they use the iCloud keychain. Every single pass key that you have will be stored in the keychain. For Google accounts, they're stored within your Google account. So usually within the Chrome browser, like we just talked about, you sign in with your Google account. There's a password vault that's within there, and you can then save pass keys within there. For Windows, it is available as well. It is synced with Windows Hello and for Windows, it is local to that device, whereas Chrome right now and iOS are able to have cloudy features so that you can access those pass keys wherever you are, whereas for Windows, it is local to that device, which if you're using the same device over and over again, you can do that. And the other thing is, is that you can sync multiple pass keys to the same account. So let's say, for example, there are a lot of sites that are currently using them. So one of them being Amazon. So if you're an Amazon customer, you have Amazon Prime, you can sync Windows Hello for Business as a passkey to that site. And then if you go to like another computer that you're using, like for myself, I have multiple computers. I have a work computer. I have a personal computer. And I have several test devices. If I go to Amazon and I want to access that site, and I've enabled pass keys, I can use my pass key on my Windows computer. If I'm on my Mac, I can then have another pass key to access my Amazon account. That's not my Windows Hello. It could be my keychain on my Mac or a password vault. So many password vaults that are out right now support storing pass keys in them, like 1Password, which Adam and I are big fans of. Dashlane's another one. Bitwarden's like the open source one that I think most people recommend. All of those are capable of storing pass keys. So you have to have a way to store them, which we do today. And then you have to have it on the application side. So like I said, Amazon, major site, uses pass keys. You can move to pass keys today on Amazon. You can do it for your Microsoft account. You can do it for your Google account, TikTok, Nintendo. I mean, those are some of the major ones. What I really like about... Um, one password is that they have this thing called Watchtower and you can go into Watchtower. It looks at like weak passwords and duplicate passwords and stuff like that. But one of the things that actually looks at for one password is the sites that you have stored in here that allow pass keys. So it has a list that says, Hey, these sites allow pass keys and you haven't stored a pass key for it. So why don't you go and do that? Cause it's going to be easier for you for Microsoft account. I went to look at this because I was like, well, I want to move to a pass key for Microsoft. It only works for Windows Hello, and I think there's going to be some more development, but for like your MSA, which is your Outlook.com or Live.com account, currently it only used for Windows Hello, works for Windows Hello on your local computer. Um, obviously, we've had password lists for a very long time that works through the authenticator. So if you haven't moved to that, you should. But a little bit about my experience using it, it was extremely seamless. I went to, for me, one password, looked at the sites that allowed it, and I went to each site and just said, let me sign in with a passkey. I synced the passkey to it, stored it in my one password vault, and I was able to then sign in on that computer as long as I had my vault unlocked on any single computer that I had my password vault. And then I also is also worked for my phone because one password has an iOS app. It has a, an Android app and those pass keys stored in there. As soon as I try to sign into a site, like for example, my GitHub, I put a pass key on it. It recognized that I had a pass key within one password and it signed in. The experience surprisingly for me was very, very good. I was extremely happy with it. If you want to sign into your account on somebody else's computer using a passkey, I haven't tried this, 
I know for iOS it works. And so there are some differences, and this is where we'll get into some of the drawbacks, but there are going to be some differences depending on where you store your pass keys. Like, for example, Windows Hello, if you're using that for your pass keys, that's not going to work on somebody else's computer. If you're doing it with the keychain for iOS, you can scan a QR code and then it'll pop up on your phone. I'm not sure if that works for 1Password or not, but... You know, there's going to be some some learning pains, I think, throughout this as we get a little bit more mainstream. But there are definitely some benefits, right? Moving to a passwordless solution for the masses, I think, kind of. You're not using MFA. You're not using a password plus a secondary factor. You're just using the pass key. So you don't have to worry about a push or a notification, a text, or a six-digit code you have to enter in. And if you're using pass keys, eventually at some point, hopefully, you can get rid of the passwords and so there's no more compromised credentials in the future. But for drawbacks, shared devices, multiple devices, you know, that's going to be the, the big one. Finding a way to not uh, compromise your pass key if you're on a shared device and you're signed into a browser, like say the Chrome browser, and your pass keys are stored there and you don't lock it or something like that. Um, and they're also tied to devices in general. So if you lose your device, you have to set up a new pass key. And I think in general, it's still a little bit complicated for most users. And until it becomes a default and there's some easy way to walk through it, then it's going to be extremely difficult to start getting most people to use it. Anything else on pass keys? Or should I chime in? No. No, I think uh, <laughs> go ahead. Let's hear what your thoughts are. Well, pass keys, I would simplify it for, for those who are familiar with it. You know, FIDO2 keys, like heart physical security keys, they're a software version of that is really what they're most analogous to and use a lot of the similar technology. The thing that's interesting about pass keys are that Apple and Microsoft and Google all came together to help formalize the standard, along with some other companies too. But it's notable whenever Apple and Microsoft and Google agree on something and do something jointly. It shows a great deal of belief in the solution. I will say as much as I've been passwordless guy and identity guy, I have done very little with pass keys to this point because I still, even for me, find it somewhat confusing and fragmented. And I think part of it has been, I haven't figured out what my passkey strategy is yet, because I am aware that when password supports it, it actually kind of starts to hound you to use it at this point. And I know Apple has really slick and seamless integration, and I do leverage iCloud Keychain heavily. So there's that, but then that doesn't extend to the Windows e ecosystem. And as you pointed out, Andy, to this point, although Microsoft has implemented it, it's still local storage only. There's no sync mechanism yet. And actually, the sync mechanism has been a little bit contentious in the sense that it breaks some of the security promise of this. Because when I take that private key and I sync it across all my devices and give it and hold it in the stewardship of someone else, like a one password as an example. And it's only protected by whatever protections I have around my iCloud keychain or my one password. There are risks involved with that, but there's also convenience. And we've talked about this a little bit in the past that FIDO2 keys were never going to see widespread adoption because of the challenges with usability and ease of use. And so pass keys were supposed to fix a lot of that. And to be honest, yeah, you know what? If you live in the Apple ecosystem full time, or even the Google ecosystem full time, it's relatively straightforward at this point to start generating pass keys, sync them to your, your iCloud keychain. It's on all your Apple devices and away you go. I think it's harder for people who have a multi-platform life 
which is so many of us where we, we bounce around from platform to platform all the time and finding that one solution to rule them all. It's probably the password manager, but like you point out, Andy, there's nothing stopping you from just generating multiple pass keys and having a pass key for your Apple ecosystem and having another pass key and one password and having another pass key stored local in windows. Hello. That's perfectly fine. It's more work and maybe more complexity to manage, but it's perfectly fine. So I, I'm not saying I'm waiting on the sidelines. I think I'm ready to dive in. I did not know about Watchtower in 1Password, so I will go check that out and see which sites of mine are capable. And then you mentioned some interesting companies like Nintendo. Nintendo's identity is kind of terrible. So if they're going to let me use passkeys, that's a huge improvement. For, for, and, and you know who they are. For some organizations you work with, you know like this sign-in process is really a hassle. And so passkeys are going to streamline that significantly. And they certainly are more secure and better in almost every way. Now, I think it's interesting you touched on how because they're local to the device or local to that sync concept, if nothing else, then you may still need a backup of a password or multi-factor authentication. Microsoft does allow you with the MSA, the Microsoft account, the consumer identity to remove your password entirely, to not have one. And it will go through various means to validate your identity if you don't have a passwordless method available to you, like you don't have your authenticator app anymore. You lost the phone it was installed on. They'll send you an email with a code and then they might text you a code or whatever. It will go through a couple of steps using different methodologies to contact you and do uh, a two-step validation that way. So, you know, I still think there's ways to solve this, but you're right. The, the core technology is there. We have the credible alternative. Now it's all about massaging the rough edges of the use case itself. What are the edge cases users might run into, what are the rough edges they might run into, and how do we soften those and smooth them out to make adoption simpler and easier? The core technology is good. We don't need to change passkeys. Passkeys are great. We need to make onboarding, managing, using passkeys, maintaining passkeys. Those are the things we need to get easier. And that will come. As I've pointed out on this show many times, whenever anyone has heartburn about implementing, say, multi-factor authentication in a corporate environment, I point out that it's been so normalized, not just through banks, because banks actually do a crappy job with it, but one company that's done a great job is Apple. Not only does Apple make multi-factor authentication relatively straightforward with your Apple ID, is they've used the carrot to drive adoption. There are multiple things that you cannot do or do not work unless you're using multi-factor authentication with your Apple ID. And that's the right approach. And so I would love to see a similar approach happen with pass keys to where to get access to this new cool feature, you need to have pass keys set up and enabled and default on your account for insert provider here. And that day will come. I truly believe that because they all feel pain from managing passwords as well. And if they can make this easier, everyone will benefit. So I think more to come. But again, I, I don't think you need to wait on the sidelines to, in the sense that, well, you know, passkeys may not pan out. Passkeys will pan out. It's fixing all of the periphery around pass keys that we need to solve for, but that will happen because there's enough industry momentum, there's enough industry support, and most importantly, there's enough industry agreement that this is the right thing to do. So um, I look forward to our passwordless masters in the future. Yeah, as I was making the show notes for this, and talking through it in my head, essentially, 
I was thinking of possibly migrating to iCloud Keychain as my primary password vault and looking through some of the options because when you said that you use iCloud Keychain heavily and obviously you also use Windows, there is a way to sign in using your iCloud Keychain passkey to your Windows computer for an application if it recognizes that you have a passkey stored in iOS. It will then put up a QR code. You scan the QR code. There's some sort of Bluetooth communication within the app that somehow can sense that your phone is near, even though it's not synced to mm -hmm. the device. I'm not exactly sure how that works because what if you're on a, a desktop that doesn't have a Bluetooth card? Like my desktop that I'm on right now doesn't have a wireless card installed because I built it, and so there's no Bluetooth. So I'm not sure how that's going to work because that's a proximity check to make sure that your phone is near that computer and physical proximity. And then there's an um, a prompt that pops up similar to like a MFA prompt that you approve and then you have to use your face or pin on your mm -hmm. phone and then you get in. So similar to a MFA type experience right now. So I thought about moving to iCloud Keychain but there's just some features that aren't in parity compared to a traditional password vault. And you have to like piece things together. One example is, and I found out that iCloud key, Keychain can actually store MFA mm -hmm. tokens, which is something that 1Password does very seamlessly, but it's a little bit more kludgy on iOS. And then the secure notes, right? So that's, that's one of the other things you can lock notes on iOS and and be able to authenticate that through the keychain. But I think there's just some benefits to having a, a password vault like one password or Bitwarden is just a little bit more of a better experience overall instead of having to like piece together things uh that features. Like for example, I store a copy of my passport and driver's license in my password vault. So when I travel in case I lose my physical copy i have one within my password vault and hopefully i don't lose my phone as part of that right so it's you know there's just some backups there that on ios i don't i'm not sure if i'm natively using the keychain that that would happen right being able to put in notes into mm -hmm. your accounts right like you can't really do that on ios you'd have to do it in notes or something like that so i think the strategy for me is probably still continuing to use the password vault to do this and while it is putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, the seamless nature of being able to bounce between operating systems as well as you know, all the features of a password vault in general just kind of trump everything else. Agreed, and I think that's the road I'll head down. It's just been a little bit of honestly waiting for it to mature a little more. But I will say... And it's it shouldn't have been a surprise that this happened, but it kind of was. Google implemented passkey support for Google accounts, and they've been kind of resistant to really implementing anything above and beyond like FIDO one support. And they were very early. They basically helped create the FIDO one standard with their um, Titan. Was it Titan? This Titan security keys, whatever they called those. They they were like one of the first to ship, you know, a physical thing you plug in your USB device and that standard that ultimately led to the FIDO1 standard. Um, but that was still like a second step after your password. And there have been multiple instances when I've needed to sign into my Google account on, say, a device that's not mine or a smart device. And I have a really long, complex Google password because it's a very important account to me. And I've had to type in this horrific password multiple times versus on my Microsoft consumer account. It's, oh, we'll send a push to your Microsoft Authenticator app, match the number, and away you go. And scan your face, and you're good. And so it's been a thorn in my side that why doesn't ha Google consumer identity have remote parity with Microsoft consumer identity? Well, with pass keys now, they can, finally. And that's something I am motivated to implement because that's been such a particular pain point for me. So 
maybe I'll look into getting yeah. that plugged into my one password. But like you pointed out, you don't have to just pick one. I can put one in my iCloud keychain and I can put one in my one password. There's no harm. So other than you could argue maybe some additional uh, attack surface or whatever, but I mean, as long as those are both well secured and they are, it's, it's minimal if it, if it gives me the security, the usability benefit. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great show tonight. We talked about quite a bit. Hopefully as listeners and viewers of the show, you learned something, a little takeaway that you can go and make your organization safer. We'll have all of our contact information in the show notes, as well as links to the topics that we talked about tonight. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about, please reach out. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.